Hi, I'm Uma Ramakrishnan. Uh, I'm at the National Center for Biological Sciences uh, in Bangalore, uh, where we do basic science research. Uh, and I'm going to tell you today about some research we've been doing in my lab for the last several years. Uh, so in the first part of the talk, uh, I discussed biogeography and how we study uh, patterns of speciation across the world. Uh, what I'm going to do in this part of the talk is focus on uh, two examples of speciation, um, one in more detail and the other just touch upon it, uh, about speciation uh, in mountain ranges uh, associated with the Indian subcontinent, which is where I live. So we started out with this uh, beautiful picture of biodiversity across the world uh, and realizing that biodiversity seems to be high in certain locations. And now I'm going to zoom in on the Indian subcontinent. And as you can probably see, um, there's two particular kinds of places where biodiversity appears to be high here. Uh, these are the Himalayan mountains. Uh, you can see that, you know, like a comet of yellow uh, radiating out of Southeast Asia. Uh, and in the south, uh, the Western Ghats, the small sliver of uh, yellow uh, down the coast uh, in the west. So these are two mountain ranges, the Himalayas, of course, uh, many of you are familiar with uh, the less known Western Ghats, a really old mountain range uh, in the southern part uh, of the Indian subcontinent. So what is it about these mountain ranges which seems to allow for uh, speciation and the presence of high biodiversity here? So let's abstract this a bit. This is what we always do as evolutionary biologists. We take a really complex problem and we think, how can we break this down to something really simple, right? So you think of a mountain range, and you know if you've been on any mountain top, that the top part of the mountain tends to be really cold, whereas the bottom part of the mountain is hotter, right? So if you think of a mountain, the environments uh, are different as you go up the mountain. And so you could imagine then that uh, over time, you would have populations which live in the cold and wet part of the mountain, as well as down uh, at the base of the mountain, in the hotter, kind of wetter parts. We're talking about the tropics, remember. That's why it's hot, right? But over, you can imagine, though, that mountain tops have smaller areas, right? So imagine you have a mountain. It's a triangle. The top of the mountain has a smaller area. And the next top of the mountain is further away than the base of the mountain which could be more continuous, right? So you can imagine then that the base mountain populations are more continuous, right? There's less barriers potentially between them, these populations, than those which live on the top of the mountain. Now, such species that live on mountain tops are actually called montane species. They're adapted to living in, on mountain tops. A very classic example are pikas. Uh, many of you are familiar with them. Uh, pikas are a classic story also for climate change because as the climate warms, since they live on the top of the mountain, they have nowhere to go and they simply go extinct. So what we are going to ask is about a question about the evolution of montane bird communities in the Western Ghats. So what I'm showing you here uh, is an elevational profile of the Western Ghats. I've, what I've done is I've taken a cross section of this mountain from the north all the way going to the south. And you can see the mountain range is going up and down, up and down, all the way from the north to the south. So it so happens that above about 200, 1,200 meters or so in elevation, the habitat changes. And it becomes like what you see over here. These habitats are called sholas. They are mixtures of grasslands and forests. You can see there's actually rhododendron here, which is a very uh, cold adapted species. Uh, and it tends to be cold and drizzly and wet for most parts of the year. So these montane habitats make the species which live here special, montane species. But if you look uh, a bit more closely, you can see that in this elevational profile, there seem to be three kind of barriers where the mountain really dips down and goes back up. And so what we decided to do when we're studying this uh, problem is to say, well, let's just look at the effect of these barriers. How do these barriers, do they drive allopatric speciation? Do they cause differentiation? And how does it affect the entire set of birds which live in these mountain habitats in the Western Ghats? Uh, 
So because there's three barriers, right, one, two, three, you have four populations on the sides of these barriers. So how do we actually study this? How do we look for the effect of a barrier? So remember, we go back to DNA. That's where the story of evolution is recorded. And if we were to sample birds from across these four populations and build a phylogeny, build a set of relationships between A, B, C, and D, we would expect to see certain things. For example, if all the barriers were important, right, if it was like the Hawaiian chain of islands, where each island has a different uh, history in a sense and species are related on that island, we would expect to see A as distinct from B and C as distinct from D, all four separate. On the other hand, it could be that some barriers are not important. So for example, A and B could be together because this particular barrier is not that much of a barrier at all and C and D could be separate and similarly, we could have two populations, A and B together and C and D together. And finally, no effect of any barrier. These are, these are birds after all. Maybe they just flew. Um, and so we would have A, B, C, D all together, all mixed up, no impact of the mountain being a um, place where there's ecological differences between species. So I'm going to just show you these barriers a little bit uh, better. Uh, since you haven't been to the Western Ghats, it's actually nice to see these on Google Earth, for example. What we've done in this slide is we've colored the montane environment. So you can actually see that's the extent of the area that a montane species could occupy. And you can see uh, the barrier between A and B, which is marked over there as well. Uh, you can see, for example, the much deeper barrier between B and C. This is actually a break in the mountain range. It's called the Palghat Gap, and there's an extinct river which used to flow through here. You can see that, you know, how the mountains actually break there. And finally, the barrier between C and D. So also notice that the area of the populations on either sides is actually quite different uh, in these different cases, but we'll get to that later. This particular barrier is called the Shenkota Gap, which separates C and D. So what did we do? How do we actually do this research? So it's a really a lot of fun. Uh, we actually go to these mountains we go high up onto these mountains and we catch uh, 24 species of birds, individuals from 24 species. And I show you uh, all of these birds here. Uh, I've tried to highlight in black boxes the ones which are endemic. Remember we talked about endemism in the first part? These are special to the Western Ghats. They only live here. They don't live anywhere else. Uh, and what we do is we set up these uh, nets and catch species in the net. Don't worry, it doesn't hurt the birds at all. It's like a pouch, they just fall in and then we take them out, we take measurements uh, and we use a capillary to take a small bit of blood uh, from the bird wing uh, and then we let them go. We then come back to the lab, uh, sequence DNA uh, and we come to the results, try and understand patterns of speciation. So just uh, for formality, we sample over a thousand individuals, but the data I report is from about uh, 300 plus individuals uh, and about 5,000 base pairs of genetic data. So what are the patterns we see across this community? So just step back for a minute and think, okay, these 24 species of birds, very different. Our question is, how are they responding to this mountain range? How are these barriers impacting these species? So remember, it's possible that the mountain doesn't matter to these species at all, right? And they're all mixed up, A, B, C, D. Or we could have one major barrier, that's the Palghat Gap, you saw that barrier. It really seems like a break in the mountain. Or we could have shades and grades of two barriers, uh, or, th or, or all three being barriers. So while these schematics or these phylogenies are nice models for us to think about the results, what did we actually find? Uh, I'm showing you here uh, a figure from our paper where we try to represent the essence of what we found. Uh, it's a bit easier to understand this way than to look at, uh, you know, 24 phylogenies. Uh, what I'm showing you here is that for 14 of the 24 species, we found no pattern at all. It appeared as if the mountain didn't exist for these birds. They appeared to be continuous. By continuous, I mean in terms of genetic uh, differentiation across this mountain range. But for 10 of the, four, of the 24 species, it appeared 
like there were breaks or genetic differences caused by being on these mountain tops. And it turns out that for all of these 10 species, the deepest valley, the deepest, widest valley, the Palghat Gap, which sandwiches uh, this mountain range, uh, appears to be the most impactful. Uh, so that's what we show over here, that you know, uh, for 10 of these 24 species, this break, which we represent as a break in this line, correlates spatially with the Palghat Gap. Okay? So this particular barrier seems to cause the most genetic differentiation, suggesting that uh, it is important in terms of species evolution across the community. What was even more interesting was, when we look at these other barriers, the next deepest barrier or the, you know, the second most important from a physical perspective, the Shankota Gap, it appears that of those 10 species, three, these three over here, were impacted by the Shankota Gap. So the deepest valley had the largest impact and the next deeper valley had slightly less of an impact. And it impacted species which were a subset of those earlier 10 species. And finally, this shallowest valley, which is the uh, Chelia River Valley, had the most, has a minimal impact and it affected only one species. Again, a complement of those 10. So putting this uh, in a Venn diagram, sometimes easier for us to understand that way. Uh, 10 species in blue were impacted by the Palghat Gap. Three of those 10, a subset, were impacted by the Shankota Gap. And one of those three was impacted by the shallowest Chelia River Valley. So now it's not just interesting that this was a nested pattern, but what was also interesting was that time was also nested in the sense that um, the deepest valley uh, had, was the oldest divergence, corresponded to the oldest divergences on that phylogeny. Remember when we talked about Hawaii, uh, it was like the oldest splits were between the oldest islands. Similarly here, it appeared like populations on either side of the Palghat Gap were most different in terms of evolutionary time as well. And you can see that uh, in this figure over here, that the oldest divergences were across uh, the Palghat Gap, uh, following that the Shankota Gap, and the most recent divergences were across the Chelia River Valley. So in terms of actual amount of time, this was all in the last few millions of years. So we can map when these divergences were for all these 10 species and look at that a bit more carefully. So that's what is shown in this graph here. I'm just showing you for all those 10 species, when did they diverge across the Palghat Gap, okay? And while two of these are relatively older, a majority of them are relatively recently in a time period which we call the Pleistocene. And this is where climate comes in. So what I show you here is now how temperature has been changing over time. We know this from various other sources of information, from sediment cores, for example. And this is a global pattern, okay? So it's not just about the Western Ghats. Globally, in the last two or so million years, temperature has changed very, very dramatically. And that is called uh, the Pleistocene, this period of time. Uh, and so uh, several authors have suggested that this may be why we see lots of diversification or changes, dynamic changes in the Pleistocene. Why might these temperature fluctuations impact our birds in the Western Ghats? Well, remember I told you these are montane birds. They live on mo mountain tops. Mountain tops are cold and wet. When the temperature changes, the extent of the mountain top, in a sense, the habitat, the mountain habitat, could be shifted down or up. If it's warmer, it goes up. If it's colder, it may come down. And so when it comes down in those periods, these species may be more connected. Whereas when it's warmer, they may be less connected. So you can imagine the Pleistocene as a period of isolation and connection, isolation and connection, much like sea level changes and how islands could be connected or isolated when sea levels went up or down. So to summarize here, the patterns we see are nested, uh, but also linked to climate. So the physical barriers matter, but climate is impacting how much of a barrier these valleys actually are. We also found actually uh, from our phylogenetic data that two of the species we're looking at 
were actually uh, cryptic in the sense that uh, it turned out, for example, the laughing thrush, when we looked at its phylogeny over here, there's actually four populations of laughing thrushes, which are distinct enough to be four species. So remember those A, B, C, D? So it turns out that every laughing thrush on A is distinct from that on B, is distinct from C, and so on. And when you put these into a larger bird phylogeny, you put them along with their sisters, it seems like they're very different. They're so different that we think this benefits, they be called a new genus. They're not truly laughing thrushes as what they thought they were, people thought they were, but they're something completely different. We suggest that this genus be called Montesincla, and this work is still uh, in revision, but hopefully will be out soon. Uh, another example of cryptic diversity which we uncovered uh, is that of the short wing. So again here, um, you can see there are three populations. Uh, a, B is together and it's one species, C and D. And so we suggested instead of one species of short wing, that there be three species of short wing now. And again, looking at the bigger phylogeny, short wings are not short wings at all. They're actually closer to something else. Um, and so we suggested a, a name for this genus, Sholicola. So Sholicola actually means uh, bird of the shola, translated from a local language. And we felt that would be appropriate because you know, these species are new to us from a DNA perspective, but uh, natives of the Western Ghats, people who live here, have been seeing these birds for many, many years. Uh, and so we thought it would be good, uh, nice to name the genus uh, after a local name uh, in this case. And I should probably just take a minute to tell you here that you know, my postdoc, Robin, who did this work, uh, he actually initially got interested in this problem because he heard the birds on either side of this deep valleys and their songs seemed really different. You can see from the illustrations that they do look a little different, but the divergence is on the order of two million years. So basically, uh, birds on either side of the Palghat Gap have not had gene flow or exchanged genes for over two million years. Um, we also got some conservation insights. So before I, actually before I jump in, I just should mention that, you know, we talked about quantifying biodiversity in the first part, right? Uh, and we said, okay, how do we define species? Well, in trying to understand speciation in the Western Ghats, we also learned about, uh, we re-quantified biodiversity there. We learned about new species there based on our data. We also learned more information uh, for, which is relevant for conservation. For example, uh, this particular bird, the Nilgiri pipit, uh, many surveys early on had suggested that it occurs in quite a wide distribution. Uh, there were suggestions that the distributional range was about 11,000 square kilometers. But when we looked very carefully at our MISNET records, where we had actually caught this bird and looked at it in hand, and use DNA to prove that it was a Nilgiri pipit, which is very important, uh, we actually saw that its range was actually much more restricted. This bird seemed to live only in marshy areas above 1400 meters. And when you look at the total amount of area of that kind of habitat, it reduces to only 400 square kilometers. So when we had a more careful scientific quantification of this biodiversity, where this bird occurs, we actually were able to show that it maybe is more threatened than we think it is, than we thought it was. This is a kind of a example of a side benefit uh, and a conservation insight that we got from looking at our data a little bit more carefully. So to kind of summarize the work on the Western Ghats, it appears that deep valleys are biogeographic barriers for montane species, the habitat barriers, the habitat on as we go down the valley is very different and potentially montane species cannot live in those very different habitats. It appears that climate has played a role in shifting these things up and down. Why? Because the divergences appear to correlate with when climate was really changing dramatically across the globe in the Pleistocene. Um, and basically, um, I guess, you know, what we still don't know is why we see these patterns. Why do certain birds uh, show a stronger pattern than others, for example? Why do some birds not show a pattern at all? Overall, there's a general pattern, 
but the details of why uh, is something we are still investigating. For example, are certain birds better flyers and so dis they, they're able to traverse the barrier irrespective uh, or is it something about uh, how plastic they are? Are they able to adapt uh, more easily to non-mountain environments? These are the kinds of secondary questions which we need to uh, delve into more and we will be doing so in the near future. I think it's also really important, uh, early on I said, how generalizable are these patterns, right? So now that I've done this huge amount of field work and uh, you know, I've done this study, can I say this is a general paradigm? So can I actually make a prediction for the Western Ghats? Well, one prediction we would make, for example, is that if you were to look for the two most different individuals of any species, they would always be on either side of the Palghat gap, okay? And uh, as, as, you know, other researchers kind of work in this area, we hope that they will actually test these predictions, uh, add to them, you know, maybe change them, uh, and say, oh, this is not generalizable to, uh, you know, mammals or centipedes or frogs, uh, but that's what we hope uh, we can generate with this study, a further study in the Western Ghats. Very recently, there was a paper published on bush frogs. These are really tiny frogs, and if you actually look carefully at this picture over here, it's actually a frog on someone's finger. So these are really, really tiny frogs, and so clearly their levels of divergence are way higher because they hardly move, right? But even in this case, this was a phylogeny of bush frogs across the Western Ghats. It turned out that the deepest split in the phylogeny was on either side of the Palghat Gap. So again, this suggests that the Palghat Gap, this deep valley, this deep barrier, may be a barrier for many other species. So imagine it's kind of a really cool to think of this irrespective of the species you're talking about, if it seems like the shape of the mountain it was, is what is driving evolution, that's really cool. Uh, from a conservation perspective, you can then say, oh, we need to protect these areas which have highest diversity and they should be on either side of this barrier, for example. So the Western Ghats was a really nice uh, study system uh, because uh, they're a relatively short mountain chain, a linear uh, mountain chain, um, which is habitat-wise pretty unique. So they're quite wet and they exist in the relatively dry uh, kind of landmass of the Indian subcontinent. So they're almost like an island mountain chain uh, in a relatively arid uh, landscape. A much more complex and difficult problem is to think about the Himalayas. Now the Himalayas are amongst the longest mountain ranges in the world. They're certainly the highest, right? Uh, we all know that the highest mountains in the world are part of the Himalayan range. Uh, and what's also interesting about the Himalayas is they go uh, from the west uh, all the way to the east. And the eastern part of the Himalaya tends to be more tropical. It's closer to the equator because it's more southern than is the western part uh, of the Himalaya over there. So now this is a really challenging problem. Again, we could ask, what is driving speciation or the accumulation of biodiversity? How has biodiversity been assembled in this incredibly long uh, and complex mountain range? We did a little bit of work on this uh, from a biogeographic perspective, looking at species which occur here and what are the distributions of species. Kind of similar to the stuff we talked about earlier. We were talking about species across the world but we did this uh, with a specific focus uh, on the Himalayas. So before we begin to study uh, speciation in this really complex landscape of the Himalayas, uh, let's step back a bit and think about how species are distributed in this area. Let's become biogeographers in the style of Wallace uh, again and think how many species are where along the Himalayan chain. So this, uh, this figure shows you, for example, species richness or the numbers of species uh, in Asia. And you can see immediately, of course, as we already know now, uh, speciation, species richness or numbers of species are higher in the tropics. Uh, and Southeast Asia has really high numbers of species. And we seem to have a trail of species going into the Himalayas, so going west, right? It's like a comet of diversity. Uh, decreasing as we go west. So we also noticed earlier that uh, the Himalayas, while it's a, a east-west mountain chain, the eastern part of the Himalaya 
is kind of more south. It's closer to the tropics, whereas the western part of the Himalaya is more northern, right? So maybe this difference in the numbers of species, looking only at the Himalayas, is simply because the eastern part of the Himalaya is more tropical and the western part of the Himalaya is more temperate. Uh, this could be the case, but we actually, when we looked at this pattern a bit more closely, we noticed something else. We noticed again a nested pattern. So this just shows you um, a subset of those data for uh, rodents. Uh, and when we looked at this a little bit further, we saw this nested pattern. So what I'm showing you here is basically a cartoon of species richness and how it's varying in the Himalayas. Imagine that the cell on the extreme with lots of uh, species is the easternmost part of the Himalaya. And as we move from one cell to the other, we are going west, okay? So yes, you can see that the number of species is decreasing, right? But also, it's not just the number of species, it's as if we are losing species. So this pattern is nested. So every cell uh, that is to the west has a complement of the species to the east. And so this suggests that maybe um, we're kind of losing species as we go from uh, east to west, okay? Potentially suggesting a strong role for um, dispersal or movement along this mountain range. Now, it's just a hint that I'm going to give you. But if we wanted to really understand speciation uh, in the Himalayas as we did uh, for uh, the Western Ghats, we, would, we are going to go back and look at DNA. But just to reorient you, we can also look at this nested pattern with uh, statistical analysis, and that's what I show here. Again, the East seems to have many more species and complements of, species, of those species are found in the West. So how do we actually test uh, what's happening here? So remember, we talked about this earlier. Uh, imagine this is a, a, a cross-section of the Himalayan mountain range. Imagine if there is allopatric speciation, as was the case in the Western Ghats, where you had the valleys causing differentiation and speciation. So imagine then, like there, we could actually say, oh, there are, you know, these A, B, C, D, E, five populations. So we've actually started work on this, where we're actually, in this case, focusing on small mammals, these two species or sets of species, rats and niviventers. Uh, they're both part of the rat family, but they're kind of a little smaller than, uh, you know, big mammals. They don't move as much, so maybe a better system to study. And what we want to ask is, again, uh, do we see similar patterns as in the Western Ghats? For example, do we see a pattern like this, where we see all uh, rats from A are together with other rats from A, and so on and so forth. Um, I can't reveal the results to you yet. This is still in the works. But uh, I can say that this doesn't seem to be the case. The pattern and story in the Himalayas seems to be a little bit different. And you'll hear more about that soon, I'm sure. So I'd like to summarize now. Uh, Western Ghats uh, as a mountain range are really interesting. And there seems to be allopatry or speciation because of deep barriers. And the deeper barriers, the deeper the barriers, the older the divergences. Um, so the deepest, widest valleys have disproportionate impact on speciation processes here. Um, this is very important also because mountain habitats uh, are very threatened. You can see in this picture, for example, the short wing, the bird we talked about earlier. And we did another study where, you know, you remember we talked about A, B, C, D? Well, if you blow up A and you look uh, in more depth at the fragments of forest uh, there, uh, it's actually quite fragmented. So it turns out that these montane habitats, these high elevation habitats, are also really good to grow tea in. So several, uh, you know, several years ago now, the British uh, actually used these areas to grow tea. And because they started growing tea, the natural montane vegetation was lost. And so now these species exist not just in natural ABCD islands, but islands within these islands, habitat islands, because of fragmentation. And so we showed, for example, that already these habitat islands are impacting movement uh, of species within them. So um, 
this figure over here actually shows genetic differentiation between natural habitat islands, that is, those separated by valleys, and anthropogenic or human created islands, those created by tea or habitat fragmentation. So, while the Western Ghats uh, is a very interesting case study and a place we need to think about ongoing fragmentation and creation of new islands, the Himalaya seems to be much more complex uh, and maybe dispersal from uh, nearby areas like Southeast Asia and so on, as suggested by the nestedness movement from east to west, uh, may be more important in driving speciation versus actually what's happening along the uh, Himalayan range itself. So the Himalayas, unlike the Western Ghats, may be more connected to their environment around them. So I'm going to stop here uh, and thank uh, the various funding sources we've had. Uh, we work in natural areas, and so we must work uh, in collaboration with the forest departments uh, in these areas. And we've been very lucky to have in ex very good support uh, in that uh, respect. Uh, a lot of this work has been done in collaboration uh, with uh, uh, Sushma Reddy, for example, uh, and several others. Um, we've had funding from the National Geographic, uh, from the Department of Atomic Energy, surprisingly, uh, the Field Museum, uh, and several other places. Uh, of course, I'd like to also thank my parent institution, NCBS, and thanks for listening.